I probably should have said this this morning, which I did not, and that is feel free to get up anytime you want to. You know, stand at the side, pace at the back. Did you hear what I just said? Good, because this is the research. 50% of brains learn best when they're standing and their bodies are moving. So think back to middle school and high school. What were you told to do? Sit down, shut up, be still, do your work. Doesn't work for half of brains. I couldn't string two logical sentences together to present to you if I had to stand still behind some kind of podium. So if you have that kind of brain, get up any time you want to and move around, because I figure it's a pity to waste an hour. And if I were orchestrating the way schools were set up, it would be with half standing desks and half sitting desks. So you could sit some time and then trade off and stand up some time and so on. But the ship of education is about at least a quarter of a century behind brain function information. So it's amazing that people do as well as they do in school. I don't know how far behind churches are, but we won't go there. So I only do this topic by request. And I got a request to come and do it. So I don't know, somebody here evidently needs to hear this. Because there are some interesting things about the human brain and the minute you say you're going to talk about sexuality, a certain percentage of people just faint dead away on the floor. Like they don't think they got here with anything to do with sexuality. I don't know what they thought. You know, you rub your nose and you just show up. So this is a topic, you know, I, I, I don't like to say, especially if there are young people in the group, I wish I'd known this when I was your age, so I won't say that. But I do believe that if you understand this, it can really make a difference about how you make choices about your behaviors in life. So let's go. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the human brain, just so we're all on the same page. And this is a picture of a human brain up here on the left side. This is a picture of the same brain cut in half. And you would literally see chunks of pieces of the brain if you were really looking at, since I've only got carry-ons, I didn't bring my brain with me. I mean, I didn't bring my brain model with me. Hmm. Sometimes, <laughs> got to be careful what I say. I didn't bring my brain with me, and there'll be some wise guy in the group that'll say, then what am I doing here sitting listening to you? So you would see chunks of the brain without a microscope, you would see the brain stem and the cerebellum right here, and I've just taken that picture, cut it apart, so here's the first layer. You'd see this middle layer, which is the emotional brain or the mammalian brain, and I'm sure you know where those names came from. This first layer is the reptilian brain because... because... That's all reptiles have. They just have this little piece right here. That's why they really don't form relationships. They are interested in safety and security and food and maybe fertilizing an egg once in a while, but that's about it. I was in Australia for my first lecture tour, 2000, and I, I like to watch a little television when I travel because it's so different in each country. So I happen to be watching this talk show, and here comes a hunk onto the stage. And I tell people I'm not so far over the hill, I can't recognize a hunk when I see one. And the hunk comes onto the stage and says, our guest today is a man who's bringing his a boa constrictor with him. And so pretty soon out walks this young man, and he's got this boa constrictor wrapped all around him, and I'm telling you, the diameter was good size. And he's standing there petting the boa constrictor and telling the hunk 
how much he loves the snake and how much the snake loves him. I was sitting on the bed in my hotel room and I laughed so hard I fell off the bed on the floor because the snake does not love him. There's really no love for anybody but yourself in that first layer of the brain. It's very egocentric. It's all about me. So I'm just hoping that that snake is always well fed when he shows up with it wrapped all around him because there is no love for anybody else in that first layer. The second layer is called the mammalian layer because mammals have it. There you go. Are we mammals? Yes, we are mammals. So all mammals have this section. Both of these first two layers are sub conscious. They do a lot for us, contain lots of functions, but at a subconscious layer, level. So you're not consciously thinking about what's happening. And then you come to this rind on the watermelon kind of piece, this third layer, and that part of the brain is, has the most complex functions. It has the function of consciousness. You consciously know where you are. You consciously know where I am. You can talk about it at a conscious level. But a lot that goes on in that part of the brain doesn't come to conscious awareness either. Some estimates are, you know, 5 to 10 percent. So the more you can become aware of what happens in that layer, the more you can deal with it. And the part that truly distinguishes us from other mammals is this part right here. It's called the prefrontal cortex, right behind your forehead. And that's the part of the brain that contains those, you know, high-level functions like conscience, willpower, morality, decision-making, the ability to think about and plan for the future which is something that the reptilian brain never does. And probably even the mammalian brain, if it does any, it's very little. And that's the part that makes us truly human. The two hemispheres, you know, your brain is about the size of your two hands, your two fists put together. And every once in a while there'll be a giant in the room with very large hands. And one came up to me one time, I think he was nearly seven feet tall. He had huge hands, the size of a dinner plate. He says to me, look how big my hands are. And I said, yes, I see that. He goes, that means I'm really, really smart, right? And I had to tell him that size has very little to do with intelligence. It's how many connections there are between the neurons that have to do with how smart you are. And, you know, maybe he's got lots of connections, and that would be great. So there are three or four bridges that connect these two hemispheres. The largest of those is called the corpus callosum. And it's probably not paved until age 20 or 21. Myelin is the equivalent, if you want, of asphalt on our planet. Or you can think fiber optics. And until that bridge is wrapped or paved, it's like, you know, driving along a gravel road with lots of potholes, which is the reason that brains that aren't done yet do behaviors that brains that are done, hopefully, are looking at that and going, what were they thinking? And I say, they probably weren't. They just hit a pothole. Because the brain isn't, it isn't paved yet. So, prior to age 20 or 21, you're prone to make decisions that you probably wouldn't do if you were 30 or 31. So sometimes you need to take a little more time and think about what it really is you're doing. For example, when you do something one time, the brain is already laying out a piece of software in case you ever want to do it a second time. 
So young people will come to me and say, I know this probably isn't very good for me long term, but I just want to do it once. And I go, are you sure? Because once you've done it once, it's much easier to do it another time and a third time and a fourth time. And all of a sudden you may find yourself with a habit that you never, ever intended to develop. And then it can be a struggle to change that habit. So this prefrontal cortex up here, the part that makes us human, takes a long time to develop. And we used to say that it's not developed until after age 20. That's absolutely true. But many people thought after age 20 meant, you know, age 21, it's done. Now we know that it may not be done till the mid or late 20s. And so you need to really be careful about the decisions you make before it's done. And choosing your life partner is one. Because guy came up to the other to me the other day. He looked all grown up, you know, two feet taller than I am, buff. We were talking about the myelination of the brain, and he goes, "Well, I'm sure my brain is done, and uh, I know exactly who I'm going to marry." I said, "How old are you, young man?" He goes, "Seventeen." Yes. Well, I'm sure at seventeen, his brain does think it's all done. But I'm here to tell you that the person that you want to wake up next to every morning for the rest of your life when you're 17 can be light years different from the brain that you want to wake up to the rest of your life when you're 27. So there are some people who somehow get it right. But the divorce rate now is approaching 54%, so there's a lot that aren't getting it right. And often when you do large sample studies, those are relationships that were started way before the brain was done. So this, these are just pictures that show. The, the blue part is as the brain becomes paved, myelinated, fiber optics are wrapped. And you can see that, you know, it doesn't get very blue until you start getting over 20 and now between mid and late 20s. So there's just a little bit about brain function. So now the human genome, and I'm sure you're familiar with that term, and all that means is the complete genetic information that was passed on to you by your biological parents, whether it happened in a test tube or the old-fashioned way, that are encoded on 23 pairs of chromosomes. Just as a matter of interest, 99% of all the DNA in your body is right in those chromosomes. 1% of the DNA is found in the mitochondria, in the little energy factories in each of your cells. And that's really a fascinating study because the, the DNA in your mitochondria mutates much more easily than the DNA in your genes and chromosomes. And those mutations last longer. So when I sent off my white blood cells to be analyzed, what they're doing is looking for the mutations in my patterns. And now they're tracking that back with all the specimens they've received for years and years to see when they no longer see that mutation. And that's where my particular line started. So it's really, I, I find it so fascinating to send in my DNA and see who I'm related to and so on. Now, back to biology, just so you remember this. You've got 22 pairs of chromosomes, and they are arranged by size and appearance all the way down to the last two. And you normally get half from your mother and half from your father. And that's the first 22 pairs. And then there's a 23rd pair, and it's called the sex chromosomes. And here on the left, you see a picture of the X chromosome, and on the right, you see a picture of the Y chromosome. 
And when I was speaking to the freshman class, and I tell you it's the freshman class because the brains aren't done yet, with a few exceptions of older students, guy in the back puts his hand up and he goes, Dr. Taylor, there's something wrong with that picture. And I said, what is that? Well, he says, look, the Y chromosome is so tiny. I said, yes, it is. It's very small. Well, that can't be. And I said, well, it is, pal, so get used to it. And then we talked about the ovum being the largest human cell and the sperm being the smallest one. And he goes, well, there's something wrong with that picture, too. I can't believe that my sperm is the smallest cell in the body. And I said, why don't you talk to me after the program? Because I think most other people already know that, and it's not a problem for them. So we had an interesting discussion. Now, when everything goes according to plan, the brain templates in ways that we have learned to expect is normal. Now, normal just means commonly occurring. It doesn't mean desirable or functional or anything. It just means commonly occurring. So when this templating happens, you will, as expected, usually get a systemizing male brain or an empathizing female out of that process, and the body, the housing, will match the brain. And that's what... Most of us uh, grew up believing happened. Well, there's lots of templating differences that we are now just learning about. This is what I call the gender brain continuum. It takes in, researchers believe, 95% of the population, meaning there's 5% of people on this planet that don't seem to fit on this continuum. We don't know much about them yet, but we'll learn. Avoid coming up to me at the break and saying, tell me more about the 5% because I'm sure I'm partnered with one. We just know they don't fit on the continuum. So at one end, you've got the empathizing brain that in all cultures that we've studied is more aligned with what we call the female brain. And we thought at first it was just an XX pattern. Now we know that it can be XX, but there can only be one X in some people's bodies, just an X zero, and in some people they have three Xs, and that impacts the way the brain develops. On the other end, we have the systemizing brain that's more equated with the male brain, and we used to think that that was just an XY pattern. And now we know that, yes, that's part of it, but there's also bodies walking around that appear to be systemizing that have an XXY pattern or an XXXY pattern or an XXXXY pattern, all of which impacts brain function. For years, we've been talking about this middle part of the brain, or the, a part of the continuum, and we used to call it a 50-50 bridge brain, meaning that the, the brain function seemed... 50% systemizing and 50% empathizing. And now we know just in the last year or two, and I told you this morning that I heard the first news announcement about what now is being called the intersex brain that I've ever heard. And what does that really mean? Well, people are not happy with this terminology, disorders of sex development. Nobody wants to be told they're a disorder. And back in the late 1800s, when I was in nursing school, we did talk about the term hermaphrodite, and people didn't like that term either, which basically meant the same thing, you know, half empathizing, half systemizing. So there is a group of conditions where the typical internal reproductive organs and the external genitalia don't match. And the brain does appear to be half systemizing and half empathizing. And the estimates are about 2% of live births worldwide fall in the intersex category, which means there's, what, 120 million people walking around on our planet that meet this definition. And that's considerable. What does it mean? It means that the individual has both 
types of internal reproductive organs and external genitalia. So in the classical intersex person, they'll have part of ovarian tissue and part of testicular tissue in the same organ, or they'll have one ovary and one testicle. They are really literally half and half people. And you probably won't know that unless for some reason the person tells you. But there's 120 people walking around that are really uh, half and half. There are several subcategories. Uh, you can look up the information if you're interested. But that's where we are with that information. Second type of variation is when the brain does not match its housing. And sometimes people really have a problem with that. So there can be a mismatch between the type of brain and the body that houses it. So for example, you can have a body that appears to be systemizing, but you've got a brain inside that skull that is empathizing. Or you've got a body that looks empathizing, but you've got a brain inside that is actually systemizing in terms of function. I can only imagine how difficult that must be for the person who owns that mismatch. And occasionally, the, the discomfort with that is so strong that people will actually go through the process of trying to change their body to match their brain. And in the United States, a couple of very famous examples of that are Chaz Bono and Bruce Jenner. Somebody said to me the other day, well, I just don't believe that. I just think that's all in their head. And I said, you're absolutely right. It is all in their head. Their brain doesn't match their body. And for many people, it's not enough discomfort for them to do anything about it. And for others, it is. There are also hormonal variations where you've got the appropriate, if you want to use that term, chromosomal complement. But during gestation, for example, in the androgenital syndrome, the female fetus is exposed to excess masculizing hormones in the mother's body. And so that little female is born looking like a male raised as a male, and then here comes puberty and nothing happens that would typically happen in a male body. And then they do some chromosomal studies and other things, and they find out that, you know, that isn't a male. It was a female who just, you know, had too much andro androgenizing uh, effects in utero. And then you've got the opposite, the androgen insensitivity syndrome, when a typical male fetus with an XY combination doesn't get enough of the andro androgen hormones and is born looking like a female. And then based on what got set up during birth to happen at puberty, all of a sudden they start growing hair on their face and their external genitals change, and everybody freaks because they've been raised as a little girl, and now they find that actually that little child was male all the time and just didn't have enough of that androgen. The other day I heard about a really interesting case, if you want to call it that, in America. This child from the age of two, who everybody thought you know, was a little girl, kept saying, I'm not a little girl. I don't want to wear dresses. I'm a little boy. The parents took the child to a psychiatrist, thinking that she was already mentally ill. And so she had a pretty rough childhood because she kept saying, I'm a little boy, and everybody says, don't worry about it, honey. I know you've got problems. And then finally was taken to a, a physician who knew what the physician was doing and said, you know, when a child feels that strongly that the child is male, not female, I think we ought to do some chromosomal studies on the child. And guess what? XY chromosome complement in two undistended 
on descended testicles. So sometimes the brain really knows. And that's why it's so important that you don't assume that you know. So let's talk about romantic sexual attraction because this is where lots of people get in trouble. It begins in the brain. That's no surprise because everything begins in the brain. And it involves hormonal surges and sexual energy. So when you meet somebody and you're attracted to them, what's happening is you are experiencing a hormonal tsunami. And that's it. That's all it is. And sometimes it makes a person want to get another individual, to get to know another individual uh, more because they've got this sizzle between them. And it's really nice to have some sizzle in the person that you plan to live with for the rest of your life. But until you're ready to make that decision, all it is is a sizzle. And people tend to make decisions based on the hormonal sizzle and don't use their brain to even think about what else is happening. I was talking to a group of young people and I said, for example, a lot of people like baby animals. So let's say you got a baby skunk and a baby cat and a baby dog, and I listed a few, and I said, so somebody looks at the baby skunk and goes, oh, that's so cute. I'm taking that home with me. And that relationship is going to stink very quickly because the attraction is just a tsunami. And now you need to pull in the functions of the frontal hormones, of the frontal lobes, and the prefrontal cortex to ask yourself, all right, I'm attracted to this other brain. Hmm, what do I know about that brain? Have I met the family? What do I know about the history? Is that the type of person that I want for the opposite parent, the other parent of my child. And when you fail to ask those questions, people partner with individuals who really don't turn out often to be good parental material, but they had a hormonal tsunami. They just never asked the other questions. Because you will be passing to your child not only your chromosomal complement, but your cellular memory, probably back for three or four generations. And it's very biblical. Those characteristics will be passed on for three or four generations. So to make a decision based on the hormonal tsunami is probably unwise. So when you and a partner say, oh, we got chemistry, you're absolutely right. You do have chemistry, but at that point, that's all you have. And whether or not you decide to pursue that needs to be a cognitive decision based on what you know about that person. It's really powerful. It can override your prefrontal cortex in a nanosecond. And those of you who have experienced a hormonal tsunami, which is probably most everybody in the room, you get, that's where you get the sweaty palms and the butterflies in your stomach and you can hardly wait to see them and you live on your cell phone in case they might text you. And it's really easy to get your life out of balance based, because you know what a tsunami is like, it's powerful. And that's what's happening in your body. The brain is the most complex piece of biological real estate in our known universe, according to scientists. There's nothing like it. No computer that can match that. And it works, as one researcher says, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year from birth until you fall in love. And then it gets hijacked. This hormonal tsunami hijacks the brain, and you become a pea brain. 
PEA standing for phenylethylamine, which is an extremely powerful hormone. And I sort of tend to think that if you didn't have this hormonal tsunami, probably as many people as get married would not get married. It pushes you toward wanting to partner with this person and perhaps have a family. And it's fueled by that chemical tsunami, which is all well and good, as long as you pull in your cognitive ability and decide whether this is a good relationship. So when you think you are romantically attracted to another brain, the brain puts out this phenylethylamine, and it in turn triggers two other powerful hormones, norepinephrine and dopamine. And if you can understand that all this is is a chemical tsunami, you are light years ahead of most people on this planet. So PEA is a very, it's, it's naturally occurring in the brain. It doesn't kick in until you think you're in love romantically. It triggers the other two substances, and it's also found in some foods. You might like to know it's found in dark chocolate and avocado. So some people like to eat dark chocolate and avocado every day. So they get some of this triggered in their brain. It's associated with that head over heels elation that happens when you meet somebody and you're romantically attracted to them. Some couples never make it past the PEA stage because it does not last. Read my lips. It does not last. At the most, it probably might stretch out to 48 months, but it's usually closer to, you know, 12, 18. If they make it past the PEA stage because they've decided that all things being equal, this is a relationship I want for the rest of my life, then everything will be well and good. PEA still won't last. So it, you know, that's what you call the honeymoon period of a relationship. You know, you're so excited about being with them and you don't want to be apart and, and all of that. But some people become addicted to the PEA. And as soon as it begins to fall off, they're done with that relationship. And you'll hear them say, you know, it's not exciting anymore. You know, I don't feel the way I used to feel. I'm, I'm moving on. And it's the excitement of developing the new romantic relationship that fuels the PEA, and they actually become addicted to that. So what happens is perhaps somebody has gone from relationship to relationship to relationship, and then they either have an accident and one of them gets pregnant, or they decide it's time to partner. And so there's probably a little extra oomph when you go on your honeymoon, depending on whether or not you've been sexually active before you partnered, got married. And then it naturally falls off because it does not last. And they get upset because after two or three or four years, I mean, this isn't nearly as exciting as it was when I got married to them. What's happening here? I must be falling out of love. No, you're just going through the natural progression of brain chemistry in terms of a relationship. So if they stay together, one or both of them may become involved in extramarital affairs. Oh, I love my partner and all of that, but it's not exciting anymore. So now they go have an affair, and what they're looking for is that hormonal hit of suddenly you're feeling like you're in romantic love. And now that, of course, can crash the relationship. And they spend the rest of their lives moving from relationship to relationship, looking for the tsunami, which 
is never going to occur in the committed relationship because that was just the first three or four years. The PEA triggers norepinephrine, which gives you, that's the piece of this tsunami that gives you the sweaty palms and so on. What's interesting about norepinephrine is, you know, some substances in the body are just hormones. And some substances in the body are neurotransmitters. They help neurons send messages between each other. The ones that are both affect every cell in your brain and body. And norepinephrine is one of those. It's both a hormone and a neurotransmitter. And, of course, it works subconsciously, but it's responsible for regulating sexual arousal. So you're in this hormonal tsunami, now norepinephrine gets pumped, and you want to become sexually involved with the person, which is the natural progression in a committed relationship. You know, we talk about monogamy, which is a joke in most places on this planet. We don't have monogamy. Monogamy means that you have become sexually active with one person and the same person only your entire life. We don't have that. It's rare. We have serial monogamy. Not the stuff you eat for breakfast. The stuff that's reoccurring. So you meet somebody, you get involved in the, you become a pea brain, and you have all of these hormones pumping, and you become sexually active with them. And then uh, that gradually falls off, and you decide, no, nah, I don't want this relationship. It's not exciting anymore. Now you move to another relationship, and you become sexually active with them. And the same thing happens. And so people can go through a lot of partners just based on the PEA. And the research is every time you become sexually active with an individual, you develop cellular memory for sexual activity with that individual. And the more encounters you have had, the more difficult it may be to develop a monogamous relationship. Because you've already set the pattern of, oh, it's so exciting. Eh, not so exciting anymore. Okay, fine. Oh, it's so exciting. No, that's not so exciting anymore either. Oh, it's so exciting. And you get addicted to that tsunami. And then the third thing is dopamine. That's part of this initial attraction. And dopamine is released when you expect something to be pleasurable. It is involved with every addictive behavior that, as far as I know, we have ever studied. Dopamine is really powerful. It's called the feel-better chemical. And in, interestingly enough, 50% of all the dopamine in your body is not in your brain and nervous system. It's in your intestinal systems. So you get involved with PEA. It puts out norepinephrine. You've got butterflies in your stomach. Now you put out the dopamine, and the dopamine feels better after you have an encounter with the person. And it's very, very easy to get habituated to, to dopamine. Now, here's something that Emory University has studied. They've used rodents because it's a little hard to do some of these studies with humans. But rat brains are very like human brains. You knew that. So if somebody calls you a rat, it's a compliment. <laughs> because they have the same neuropeptides as the human brain. And so it's really, they make actually good subjects. So this is what they found. They would take a female, a female vole, which is a rodent, had to look it up, and they will put her next to a male vole and let them get some time to get acquainted with each other. Now they take that female vole, and they put her in a, in a, I was going to say a room, but probably a big cage, where there's lots of males. And who do you suppose she goes directly to? The male that she first met in this in this one-to-one -one encounter. Uh, always seem to select that male 
from the whole group. So I find that fascinating, that part of our attraction to somebody is because we've spent a lot of time with them and gotten to know them really well. Which again is, where are you looking for your partner? I had one person tell me, you know, the best place to meet people is at a bar. I said, well, you can meet people at a bar, but the people that spend a lot of time in a bar, are they really the person, the type of person that you think you want for the parent of your child? It's a little bit like the female bowl. You meet them somewhere, you get involved with them, now you're pumping all the PEA, and you overlook the fact that maybe their choice of recreational behavior is not going to bode well for a long-term relationship. So the neurochemical tsunami is over, sometimes sooner than 18 months, but rarely longer than 48 months, and it may move toward the 48 months if you're not together all the time. So somebody lives in Australia, they meet somebody from the United States on visit or they're over in the States, they become romantically attracted, and now all they can think about is that other person. And when am I going to get to see them next? And can we Skype? And do I have a text? And because they're not together, it can extend this period a little bit. So once you make your choice, you marry, because living together is never trial marriage, ever. It's just living together. Make no mistake about it. Because until you sign on the dotted line, your brain does not kick in with your subconsciously absorbed expectations of what it means to be in this role. So people live together 10, 15 years, then they decide they're going to have a child and think, well, maybe we better, I mean, maybe we better get married, you know, better for the child. And three months later, they're separated because they developed a pattern of living together before the brain kicked in with, this is my role, this is your role, and you learned that in your family of origin. So there's lots of statistics that people who live together before they choose to marry, within five years have something like an 85 increased risk of splitting up because living together is never trial marriage. So let's say that everything's gone well, you got the hormonal tsunami, and you made a conscious decision, this is the kind of person that I want to be the parent of my child. And you get married and you have a wonderful honeymoon, and then by George, the excitement is dropping off. And you think, man, did I... Did I partner with the wrong person? In all likelihood, if you've made your best decision and your brain is done, probably not, but you're still going to get the drop. And the only way you're going to have any mini tsunamis is to make provision to do things together that are different and fun and exciting, and that's how come vacation can be so healthy. If they stay together, that initial hormonal tsunami stops, and now the brain puts out three different chemicals to help them stay together, develop a really close relationship over the rest of their life. So what are those? Researchers call that the unconditional love stage. Now, no human being ever does unconditional love the way we believe God does. But, you know, you can get close if you work at it. It's a choice. It requires at least maturity, commitment, bonding, and constant nurturing. You can't just make the decision and, okay, now you're done. You're just going to exist together. It's constant nurturing to keep those small tsunamis going. So relationships that last longer than 48 months 
are assisted by three totally different neurochemicals, and we didn't realize this until fairly recently. Oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. And you've probably heard some of those names. So what do they do? Well, oxytocin has everything to do with pair bonding. And it is produced during sexual activity. So here's the risk, especially, that females face if they become sexually active with their partner before they're committed for the rest of their lives. It increases pair bonding. So this may not be a good choice for her, but she's sexually active with him, and now she's putting out oxytocin, because it's only produced by sexual activity, and now she stays with him might not be her best option. So oxytocin, interestingly enough, crosses the blood-brain barrier, you know, that barrier, that complex, tight um, interweaving of blood vessels that prevent certain molecules from getting into the brain. Well, oxytocin crosses that blood-brain barrier. So somebody said to me the other day, well, so can you give somebody oxytocin and help them bond? Well, you could give it to them, but it's destroyed in the gastrointestinal tract, so it's never going to get into your brain. And this is what I want you to remember. Everything starts in the brain. Nowhere lower. It's all above your, all above your neck. So oxytocin helps people feel content. It helps them have less anxiety and stress. It promotes feelings of calmness. Uh, when you are in the presence of your mate. And it allows orgasm to occur. Now, I know the word orgasm is probably not in the church manual, but it ought to be. Because if there is not enough oxytocin, the relationship's not working, they're not having healthy sexual activity, then especially the female's not going to have an orgasm. And that, over time, is going to be really frustrating. So the second chemical that the brain puts out in this committed love relationship is serotonin. It's definitely found in the brain and the nervous system, but 90% of all the serotonin in your brain and body, again, is in your gut which is the reason you get gastrointestinal symptoms depending on what stage things are. And you can have diarrhea and, you know, constipation and all kinds of symptoms from the amount of serotonin. It has everything to do with sleep. Impacts mood, sexual desire again. So now you're committed, you got the oxytocin that's released when you have sexual activity, but the serotonin makes you want to have sexual activity with your partner, which then releases more oxytocin. And if you understand this, you can see how it is that people can live together for 50, 60, 70 years and be closer at the end of that time than they were when they started because they're putting out these chemicals. It increases with mild to moderate exercise as well. And, you know, that's, I'm sure, could include sexual activity exercise, as long as both people are participating in moving <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but it also is increased when you just go and exercise, you know, take a good walk. And the third one that third type that's released involves endorphins, which is the brain's natural morphine. It's an opiate. And so you can get addicted to endorphins. And people sometimes do. People over-exercise more than is good for the brain and the body because as, as soon as the brain feels uh, pain from over-exercising, out come the endorphins to help the person you know, handle the pain, and now those opiates take over and the person starts to feel better, so they over-exercise. I mean, you can get addicted to almost anything. 
So as the brain develops tolerance to those three romantic chemicals, PEA, norepinephrine, and dopamine, it starts to release these endorphins. They are also, as I mentioned, produced during physical exercise, which is how people can get addicted to... They're not addicted to the exercise. They're addicted to the endorphins that they put out when they over-exercise. It's produced again during sexual activity. Can you see how these three chemicals all have something to do with triggering or producing sexual activity so that you can get the bonding for the rest of your life. Uh, the endorphins calm anxiety, reduce stress, relieve pain. Again, increase attachment and bonding. So it's really important to develop a good sexual relationship with the person that you're married with because you want all those benefits. So bottom line is this, sexual romantic attraction likely begins completely hormonally. So just recognize that. You see somebody across the crowded room and you go, oh, I'd like to meet that person. Okay, you've just had a rush of hormones, acknowledge that. That's all it is. So then you need to use your brain to determine if this relationship is something you believe would enhance your life, you would enhance theirs, it would be healthy, functional, maybe it's something you want for the rest of your life, and explore that. But otherwise, your brain is going to be hijacked with PEA, and you're not going to have the conscious awareness to really analyze that relationship. And somebody in your family might come to you and say, you know, I really see problems with this relationship. Duh, duh, duh. Oh, no, you aren't looking at it right. At least be willing to evaluate it because their brains have not been hijacked with PEA. And they really may see some problems that you have not anticipated. Bottom line is, you're responsible for the sexual behaviors you choose to exhibit. Nobody's got a gun to your head saying, oh, I feel like I want to have sex with that person. It's just a hormonal tsunami. And you have to decide whether or not you're going to do that and what are going to be the ramifications if you do so. The problem is that PEA really impairs your judgment. It's meant to give you a push toward looking for a romantic partner. The problem, I believe, in our society is that we don't teach this to young people, number one. And Hollywood is about the poorest example of relationships on the planet. I mean, really. And so you meet somebody and you get heart palpitations and you have sex with them and, you know, you you relate to them for a while and maybe you hurry up and get married in six weeks or three months. Goodness gracious. And then after two or three or five or ten years, this isn't working and you dump them. And that's the Hollywood pattern. And it's not the pattern that's best for the brain and body. So I think that ends that slide, and bottom line is you need to think carefully about what you're going to do in life, set your boundaries, know what you're willing to do and what you aren't willing to do ahead of time. And I always think it's probably really smart to let your family really get to know that person, let your friends get to know the person, you get to know their family and decide because you are not just marrying one person. You know that. You marry the whole family system. Not only the people who are alive, but cellular memory of that family system three or four generations back that will be passed on to your child. So this is probably one of the most critical and important decisions you will ever make. And 
my bias is you need to make that decision on more than the hormonal tsunami. If you want a good quality relationship, you bond more and more as the years go by. And pretty soon this becomes your very best friend and they've got your back and you've got theirs and you have a wonderful relationship together. Unfortunately, not many people in this culture actually achieve that. And from the research, that's what I recommend.